You're listening to Romancing in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. Hello, and welcome to the Romancing in Paris podcast. I'm your host, Lily Heisey. In this podcast, we'll be traveling around the city as I pick out my top romantic spots per arrondissement. You don't have to visit these places only as a couple. Exploring them can be the expression of your own love of Paris. Are you ready to get romancing in Paris? Hello, and welcome back to Romancing in Paris. We've made it. With this episode, we've done the full round of all 20 arrondissements of the city. But fear not, there's still more romantic places in Paris to be explored. Many, many more. We'll be returning around to visit a new romantic place per arrondissement However, we'll also be focusing on some special romantic themes. More on these in the next episode. Today, we're going to journey to the 20th arrondissement. Like the 19th, the 20th has an abundance of fabulous romantic spots. Some visitors to Paris do make it up to the slopes of this northeastern district usually with the sole objective of ambling through the city's most famous cemetery, Père Lachaise. We might need to visit it ourselves in another episode of the podcast, as it's the final resting place of a star-studded lineup of romantics and illustrious couples. However, there's much more to the 20th district whose quiet back streets exude romance, with an alternative alter ego. Street art, villa streets, gorgeous views of the city, cool hangouts. There are so many places to choose from. But in today's episode, I wanted to take you to a special little-known place, a romantic gem which harks back to bygone eras, one which has connections to royal intrigues, in addition to numerous ties to other episodes of the podcast. It's the perfect episode to tie up this journey around Paris. Have I piqued your interest? Grab your chéri. We're going to the Pavillon de l'Hermitage. As we've seen in previous episodes of the podcast, dotting the outer circle of Parisian districts are a number of former villages, like Passy and Les Batignolles from episodes 16 and 17, as well as monasteries or convents, as we saw in episodes 13 and 14. In episode 18, we also discovered it different sort of place that was once outside the city centre, a folie, a countryside getaway. Today we're going to visit a similar place, but one which is older, a place which was built for a high-level noble, which also adds to its oh-so-romantic appeal. Shall we hop on the metro to visit it together? West of what is now La Porte du Bagnolet, and occupying much of what is now the southern section of the 20th district, there used to be a vast 80-hectare estate, the Domaine de Bagnolet. At the time, it would have been a few kilometres outside of Paris. Not far but also removed from the hustle and bustle of the boisterous and dirty city. Before 1600, there was a mansion on the grounds belonging to the lord of the area. However, in the 1630s, it became the property of Anne de Montefier, the Countess of Soissons, who began enhancements to the residence and created magnificent gardens. When Anne died in 1644, her daughter, Marie de Bourbon Condé, inherited the home. She carried out further works to the estate, 
and received a number of prestigious guests here. When she died in 1692, the property was bought by tax collector François Le Juge, who constructed a regal castle on the grounds, which became known as Le Château de Bagnolet. In 1719, it was sold to Philippe d'Orléans, the regent of France during Louis XV's minority, who proceeded to gift it to his wife, François-Marie de Bourbon, the legitimized daughter of Louis XIV and his mistress, Madame de Montespan. If you're a regular listener of the podcast, or avid French history lover, Madame de Montespan's name might ring a bell. She appeared back in episode 14, which was on the Abbey and Cloisters of Port Royal. The powerful official royal mistress had caused a good deal of grief to the king's other mistress, Marie Angelique de Scorai, who had taken refuge at the Abbey, possibly because of a poisoning arranged by her romantic rival, Madame de Montespan. During their ten-year relationship, Madame de Montespan bore Louis XIV seven children, of whom François-Marie de Bourbon was the second youngest. She spent much of her childhood raised at the Château de Maintenon, the castle of her governess, another mistress and the future second wife of Louis XIV. Madame de Maintenon, which was found southwest of Paris and beyond Versailles. Apparently, Francois-Marie had inherited her mother's attractive looks. She was described by a noblewoman and writer of the era, Madame de Calus, as naturally timid and glorious, a little beauty with a beautiful face and beautiful hands, completely in proportion. This made it easier to arrange a prestigious match for her, something which her governess Madame de Matignon was determined to do, and to which she succeeded at beautifully. When François-Marie was 14, she was married to Philippe d'Orléans, the Duke of Chartres and the son of the king's brother, the Duke of Orleans. Philippe was the king's only legitimate nephew, and François-Marie's first cousin, something which even back then was normally frowned upon. The engagement caused quite a scandal. When Philippe's mother, Elizabeth Charlotte, Madame Palatine, learned of the news, she slapped her son's face and turned her back on the king. A big no-no at the time. You see, even though Françoise Marie was the daughter of the king and was recognized by him, she was not born by the queen and thus was not considered at the same level as her half-siblings. Nevertheless, she still held an important position at court one which would increase even beyond what Madame de Matignon could have hoped for. Françoise and Philippe were married on the 18th of February, 1692, in the royal chapel of the Palace of Versailles, and the ceremony was followed by a wonderful reception in the Hall of Mirrors, attended by the highest-level members of the royal family and French nobility. By then, ostracized by the court due to the affair of the poisons, Madame de Montespan was not allowed to attend her daughter's wedding. Upon Françoise, Marie's, and Philippe's union, Louis XIV officially gave his brother the Palais Royal, which we learned about in episode one of the podcast, and where the Orleans family had already been living, yet didn't own. The regal residents in central Paris stayed in the family until the revolution. (music) 
the marriage offered Francois Marie a number of new privileges. Because her husband was the legitimate grandson of a king, Louis XIII, she had the rank of petite fille de France, granddaughter of France, and was addressed as Her Royal Highness. She was also allowed to travel and dine with the king. However, it wasn't always smooth sailing for Françoise Marie. She couldn't seem to shrug off the fact that she didn't have as high a status as her husband. She was also openly criticized by her mother-in-law, and sometimes even by her husband, who nicknamed her Madame Lucifer due to her bad temper. Ouch! Fiery Françoise Marie. In 1701, Philippe's father died from a stroke, which was apparently triggered by an argument which he had with the king about Philippe showing off his pregnant mistress, Marie-Louise de Serry, in front of Françoise Marie. Philippe thus inherited the title of the Duke of Orleans and all of his father's estates. This made Francois Marie a higher rank than her troublesome mother in law. Hm, maybe she was a little nicer to Francois Marie after that. With his new status and increased wealth, Philippe lived an extravagant lifestyle and became known for the lavish and risque parties he threw at the Palais Royal. Even though he had his lovers, he still consorted with his wife, who, may I add, didn't partake in Philippe's debaucherous fete, and the couple had seven children together. When Louis XIV died in 1715, Philippe became the regent over the future Louis XV, the Sun King's great-grandson, then aged five. This elevated Philippe to being the temporary ruler of France, and Francois-Marie therefore became the most influential woman in the whole country. That probably made her mother-in-law's blood boil even hotter. This period in French history, from 1715 to 23, is known as la Régence, or the Regency, a term which is associated with a shift in style as well as a number of governmental and legal reforms. Due to his new position, Philippe granted his wife an increased allowance of 400,000 livres. In 1719, he bought the Château de Banulet, which became the favorite residence of Francois-Marie. Perhaps it served as a nice escape for her from Philippe's naughty parties at the Palais Royal. Philippe eventually officially gifted Francoise-Marie the property, after which she added two large wings, designed by architect Claude Degault, the nephew of famed landscape architect André Le Nôtre, the mastermind behind Versailles' legendary gardens. She also had Bagnolet's gardens redone in both the formal Jardin à la Française and the more natural English style, which was then becoming fashionable, and which we saw in episode 17 about the Square des Batignolles. Scattered in this expanse of green space were four folies, small pavilions. These were called the Woodhouse, the Gazebo, the Orangerie, and the Hermitage, which we will visit in due course. If you're enjoying this episode of Romancing in Paris, you may also be interested in our sister podcast, Paris, A State of Mind, a wonderful show about the ins and outs of renting or buying property in Paris. Romancing in Paris will be right back after a word from our sponsors. And now, back to Romancing in Paris. 
She also commissioned a tree-line road through the vineyards of Charon village in order to connect the property better to Paris. Part of this still exists today, its original name of L'Avenue Madame being swapped for La Rue des Artaux. After her husband's death in December 1723, Françoise Marie decided to retire to the castle of Saint-Cloud, which once stood on the opposite side of Paris and has since been demolished. When Louis XV got married in 1725, Francois Marie's importance diminished. She still managed to do some matchmaking and wheeling and dealing by placing her children in high-level marriages. Although she didn't see it in her lifetime, she did end up with an even higher position, that of the great-great-grandmother of the future Louis-Philippe d'Orléans the last king of France, who ruled from 1830 to 48. Even though she had abandoned the Chateau de Bagnolet, it stayed in the Orleans family. This is where her daughter, Philippine Elizabeth d'Orléans, stayed after being sent back from Spain. She had been engaged to the future Charles III of Spain, and the couple was even very much in love. But sadly, the marriage was called off by the Spanish side. She died here at the castle due to smallpox at the young age of 19. Francois-Marie herself died at the Palais Royal in 1749 at age 71. Her son, Louis d'Orléans, the Duke of Orleans, inherited Bagnolet, although he never lived here. A few years later, he passed it to his son, who modernized aspects of the property, including converting part of it into a theater in 1761. At the end of that decade, he divided the estate up into plots and sold them off. One of these was a large plot of 11,600 square meters, upon which was the Pavillon de l'Hermitage, the only building of the whole estate which has survived to this day, and the only Regency-style pavilion in all of Paris. It was bought by the Baron de Batz, who used the pretty pavilion as a countryside escape. That is, until the outbreak of the French Revolution. In 1792, he used it as a base for royalists trying to plot the liberation of King Louis XVI. Oh la la, that wasn't such a good idea. News of this leaked out and the Baron's mistress, Marie de Grand Maison, was arrested here and subsequently guillotined. Bats miraculously survived the revolution unscathed. In 1820, the reduced-in-size estate was bought by a certain François Pomerel, who had his initials added to the façade of the pavilion. Look out for those when you visit. In 1887, his son-in-law sold it to the French Public Assistance Administration who built a retirement home where the chateau once stood. It was named in honour of Baron Alain Aquier de Brosse, an aristocrat whose family donated funds to have it built. It was rebuilt in the 1980s as the current building which borders the park. I think it's time we paid the charming Pavillon de l'Hermitage a visit, don't you think? If you're arriving by metro, the closest station is Port de Bagnolet on Line 3. You'll want to take the exit for Rue de Bagnolet, and after a few short minutes, on the left-hand side, you'll see a green space. This is now called the Jardin de l'Hospice du Bros, in honour of the retirement home's barren patron and is all that's left of the memory of the large verdant estate which once sprawled here. Take the first entrance to the park, 
and meander through it towards the little jewel box pavilion. It is now managed by an association, which, in normal times, organizes visits on Thursday to Sundays in the afternoon. Check their website to see if there is an update on these starting back up again. The inside was redecorated by François-Marie's grandson for his mistress, Etignette Marquise, and it features delicate paintings depicting the goddess Flora. Hmm, a little love nest, one could say. Even if you can't visit the interior, the outside is sublime, and you can imagine what it must have been like back in the 18th century. First, with Marie-Francoise strolling the refined garden lanes, and then, later, with the Duke of Orleans, and then the Baron de Batz meeting their lovers here. Oh, la, la. Facing the pavilion are several benches beneath pretty arbors the perfect spot to sit down and admire the building, as well as share a special romantic moment with your own amoureux. Be sure to take a little stroll through the gardens before you leave. If you would like to carry on your romantic explorations nearby in the 20th, you could take a meander down to the village Sharon, which we may visit in future episodes of the podcast. Or go to Mama Shelter East, the cool hip hotel which has a wonderful rooftop terrace perfect for an apero drink. Alternatively, you could prepare in advance and bring a little picnic to be enjoyed with the charming backdrop of the Pavillon de l'Ermitage. Thank you for listening to this latest edition of Romancing in Paris. If you've enjoyed it, please subscribe. That way you won't miss the next one. Ratings or reviews are always highly appreciated and they only take a few seconds. If you would like to discover more romantic places in the district, see my website, jetemmeneither.com, for my guides to the top romantic spots per arrondissement of Paris and other topics. Until next time, happy romancing in Paris. This episode of Romancing in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit parisundergroundradio.com.